Okay, okay we're good. recording, and I'm going to let everybody in, and I'll let you know when they're all in. Okay. All set. Okay, you're good to start. Okay, well, welcome everybody. <laughs> We're gonna be talking about uh, sketching and letting all those creatures that are running around in your brain out. You know, they, they're cooped up in there and they need to come out. So I'm Franz Bone, and uh, I will be taking you through uh, several techniques. Um, essentially though, I, I, we're just gonna draw and I will kind of uh, do some of my characters and talk about some of the projects that I've done to kind of uh, maybe outline the way that I approach doing things. And what's really important to me, anytime that I'm doing any of these kind of lessons, I will be happy to show you all sorts of little tips and things like that. But I want to underscore, there isn't any correct way to do anything. <laughs> you know, it's up to you. So you need to kind of tap into yourself and think, well, what do I want to do? And what's fun to do? What's challenging to do? Um, I think sometimes people get a little bit hung up on trying to make things look realistic when in fact, um, a lot of the fun that I have is playing off against that. I mean, I certainly can develop that and I, it's great. I do it too. Um, but it takes, you know, you got to practice and practice and stuff. But the stuff that I do for me is just delightful. And it's just so much fun to be able to do this anywhere. I take my sketchbooks with me and uh, have a terrific time. And that way, you know, if I have a sketchbook and some of the favorite Castell pit pens and materials, you can, you know, kind of carry your studio in your back pocket. And so if you have to wait at the doctor's office or if you're just kind of hanging out, you always have something to do. So we can get started. Um, Krista, you want to um, chime in? Hello, everyone. I'm so glad that you're here with us tonight. So I am Krista. I'm from Faber-Castell. And welcome. We're happy that you're here. If you have any questions, so you can chat me. I'm Ask Me Questions. And though Franz and I are not in the same room this evening, um, I'm happy to field your questions either by the chat or if I cannot answer your questions myself, I'm happy to break in to Franz's instruction and I will ask him your questions um, directly. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay, yeah, so feel free anytime. I mean, I'm just, uh, you know, if there's something you want to know more about or whatever, I'll just keep on going. Um, a long course here, but if you have any questions, be sure to ask. Now, if we can switch over to the iPad camera, I've got a couple of different things that I want to show you. Um, first, I just thought it'd be kind of interesting to go through some of the sketchbooks. I'm just going to wander over here, okay? And then what I want to do is after we look at the sketchbooks a little bit. Okay, so <clears throat> um, I, you can see that I have a variety of sizes, but for me, I prefer the smaller ones because they can either fit into my coat pocket, my back pocket, or I might have like a little bag or backpack or something like that. I have a friend of mine that carries around. He does a lot of uh, urban sketching and he has these all different sizes. But for me, I really like the small uh, sketchbooks because they also kind of um, work with the, the size and the scale of my drawing. Okay, so I'll, I'll loom up a little bit, but I just thought I, I'd kind of give you an idea of what the sketchbooks look like and how I develop them. And usually, as I'll, I'll, I'll demonstrate, I just start to draw. I don't have anything in particular in mind. I just start to draw it, and, you know, things evolve. Uh, you know, for some reason, these ended up, I was trying to figure out how to draw cats. I have two really crazy orange cats, and I just, they're so comical that I want to start drawing them. I've never drawn cats before, so I kind of started working with it. And these look, <laughs> and I finally ended up with a devil cat. And then this is, um, you know, just some fish that started to evolve. And again, as I'm drawing, the drawing itself is speaking to me at the same time. And so I may not have any particular theme or may not have really decided I'm to do an angry cat. These just ended up that way. But as, as I draw, I start seeing an expression or the implication of something, and then I go with that. 
So that's what kind of makes it a little bit more fun. And this one, I don't know if you can really show it. Yeah, you can see that I uh, had some metallic paints that somebody sent me. And I thought, well, well, we'll try and kind of play around with those a little bit. Okay, just another uh, thing where I had no idea about what I started to draw and they just kind of evolved. And um, again, some more of that reflective paint. Uh, and also you'll notice that rather than draw people, I have a tendency to draw a lot of animals. And I think it, it's partially, um, I'll show you in a, in a moment, a book that is from my childhood. This one I just liked because it looked like this big hairy guy was screaming at a, uh, <laughs> a blabbing snail. And then some hippos, I did a couple of hippo drawings and things. So there's one. And I love the pit pens. Uh, those are the ones that I'll be kind of doing most of the drawing with. They're an India ink formulation. They come in different fixed points and a brush tip. And they mimic how I used to draw with uh, pen nibs but you can get very small detail. You can get broader sweeping lines and all that. And then when I'm kind of done with a page like, like this, I will start to watercolor. So my general uh, technique is to work with the pens, which are like an indie ink when they dry, they dry permanently and they can go over them with uh, watercolor or other pit pens without them smearing as long as they give them plenty of time to draw. But, you know, I, I'll look at them and I'll think, oh, well, this, I kind of like that giraffe head. Uh, I really like this kind of monkey head uh, over here. You could, you know, just pick out the, the sketches that I think are a little bit more successful, a little bit more fun. And those are the ones I color in. So just a, a few more. And then, uh, you know, I cover the whole page. Now, my daughter used to live in London. I used to go to the British Museum and I use the sketchbook the way that a lot of people do too, where I'm just kind of recording things that I see. So, you know, the British Museum has a fabulous Egyptian collection. And I, I, I was intrigued by the, the Book of the Dead, which is kind of like the travel guide to going to the afterlife for the Pharaoh. And they were just the way that they drew snakes and stuff, I really liked. And so I, I kind of copied that thinking at one point, uh, you know, that might come in handy. But then, you know, I kind of resort to monkeys and rabbits playing banjos, uh, ducks talking to a bunch of chicks about Easter. And then sometimes I'll, you know, kind of work both ends of the book. And again, you can see, you know, some of them, I see potential, uh, fun things to color in so i'll do that and then pretty soon i just have like this whole really kind of fun chaos that's going on um i'll do some rubber stamps i'll carve some rubber stamps sometimes those get combined so yeah this will kind of give you a, a sense of what all my stuff looks like um and then you know going through here some more pages and one of the things i brought these along too is that uh, it does take a little bit of time for the pen, pit pens to set up. And so uh, I will do some fresh drawing uh, over at the other camera and kind of talk about how I do that. But then while that's setting, I could kind of come back and start coloring some of these things that haven't been colored in yet. But yeah, it's, just, it's just so much fun to start, again, working on the cats, trying to figure out how to do that. And then I wanted to then flip. And this one is, uh, I'll get a little bit closer. This is a real quick sketch I did uh, with one of Faber Castell's fountain pens with blue ink. And I drew it and it was very quick. And I, I liked it enough that, you know, it's kind of had a couple different translations. One of which is I do a lot of screen printing. So, you know, I just start off with like a innocent little sketch and I liked it. And so then I was able to trace it and darken the lines in and use it to expose to a photo screen and then some flat colors with you know, paper stencil if you're at all familiar with screen printing. But you know, occasionally I will elevate one of those silly little sketches into something that's a little bit more substantial. So I had this really nice uh, t-shirt that I like wearing that is based on one of my you know, kind of random sketches. So you never know where any of this is gonna go. Um, in addition to that, put things away. Uh, <clears throat> I've done illustration for uh, Doubleday, uh, kids books and kid book covers. And this one was uh, Broadway Banjo Bill by Leah Kameko. 
And so in kind of getting ready for, I was trying to come up with an idea for the front cover of the book. And so I was just doing a whole bunch of sketches. Let me get this a little bit closer. I think you can see that, there we go. So I just started drawing this kind of crowd scene that had all sorts of stuff in it. And you know, just very informal uh, sketches. And then I kind of used this and some others in order to kind of get the whole crowd scene that's down and through here. So again, this was just kind of like a, an afternoon of, of fiddling around, experimenting, trying some things out. And then it was something that caught my eye. And so I was able to use that as a basis of developing uh, the front cover of the book. Um, <clears throat> so then some more pages. Now just random stuff, uh, ducks and pigs. This is a whole sheet of elephants, penguins, and uh, fish. And then a lot of times it'll do like this particular kind of flying green pig up here. You know, it, once I get the pig and look at it and think, well, like this, instead of running, it looks more like it's flying. And so I'll do a real quick little background. And that's the other thing too, is that I do come up with a sketch that I like, uh, for instance, this elephant, then it's really a lot of fun then to start uh, developing the environment in which it belongs. And then that might lead to a different book or something like that. And then I don't always draw with black ink. Uh, sometimes I'll use blue ink, green ink, um, something like that. And then this next one, this next example, this is kind of like a shaggy dog story, but <clears throat> I have done these, oops, you know what? I will have to go very quickly with this one because I'm about ready to lose the battery on it. I forgot to plug it in. I do these big projects where we make huge uh, murals out of gumballs. And I had a project at the London Science Museum where we made them out of gobstoppers. So this is a, bu uh, a publication that uh, Scholastic they put together. And so they did a whole kind of article about um, you know, what I had done at the, the museum there. And then I was asked to design the back of the, of the, the thing so you could color it in similar to the gumball mural. So I started with some sketches that I did. And then I came with one that I liked quite a bit and then I refined it. And so that was then the basis for the back and some here where if I can find it. Here we are. This is what it looks like when it, it color, you, you color it in. Well, so I was also asked to do a, a project for First Night Pittsburgh in 1996. I used the same design. So this is the original drawing. And then what we ended up doing is reproducing that thing in gumballs. This is about 20,000 gumballs. And so this is six feet tall. And so I started with a sketch that's about an inch tall and kind of just made it big. And so that that is kind of the drama of what you can do with your, even though you're doing these little kind of informal sketches, they could actually become something much more important and much bigger. Okay, so um, why don't we switch to the overhead camera and we will get involved with actually having some fun. So if you have your materials and, you know, I'm gonna be using the, the pit pens, um, and I have the black ones here that are of fixed points. This is like the, the, the super uh, sharp one. All right, so it gives kind of a, a nice line that is a little precise there. They have um, several different widths, uh, a fine, a medium, uh, and then they also have the brush and it's more like kind of a, 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 as it says, it's a brush. So if I put a little more pressure, it gets thicker, thinner. So it really responds to direction and thickness. So uh, we can work that with that. They have a soft brush that is even squishier. And this is one of my favorites because you, you barely have to do anything and it just gives you a thick, thin, uh, you can get a really, really thick line but you can also get a very thin line. So this is a very versatile one. And then this is the extra, extra fine one. So you can get very fine little lines that um, may not even be showing up. Let me get a little bit closer there. There they are, okay. All right, <clears throat> so for finer detail. So what we'll do is kind of start going through 
um, how to use these. If you have other materials, if you have pencils, yeah, whatever you've got, you know, you can be using, you don't have to be using these, but uh, it's kind of the way they'll get started here. All right, so then what I'm kind of working with, um, <clears throat> with the idea, I, I, I used to sketch things out in pencil, then I would ink them up, let them dry, erase them and then color them. And I always felt that I lost the freshness of the original drawing. And so I just got to the point where I didn't even think about, it's not often I'll actually do a pre-sketch sketch with a pencil, but um, if you're starting off, it's not a bad idea. So I thought that, you know, I draw a lot of pigs. So I thought we would kind of look at a pig as just a kind of a way of getting started. So what I'm gonna do is, all right. So if you're looking straight on at a pig head and just imagine you've made a sculpture and it comes in different parts and the head's one. And so what size box would contain that pig head? All right, so we'll kind of make it a, a all right. So it's gonna fit in here some way. All right, and I can put the kind of snout and the eyes, mouth and the ears. So if you kind of start thinking about, well, where does it fit in? Where are the sides? This will help. Uh, this is the front view of it. Now, let's say that you're, you're looking at, at like a three quarter view. Actually, let's uh, flip to another piece of paper here just so we don't get too confused. All right, so I can take that box again. But if you're looking at it from the side, instead of looking straight on, you know, this is the way that you draw a box. You know, if you're kind of looking at the edge and two sides. So this, again, may be a way for uh, you to kind of think about how to, to work on. Now, if you take a square in geometry and you do two diagonals where they cross, that's the midpoint in the square. So very lightly, I'm gonna do the same thing. So the midpoint is there, the top, the other side. So I'm, these are just kind of like little points to help give me an idea of where to put things. All right, so I think we got them all. All right, now if you think about cutting, let's say that the pig's head is a, a sphere. Think about you know cutting it in half. And so I'm gonna have this circle that would come around here, come around here, and come around here, and come around here. All right, so that's floating inside exactly you know, half below, half above. And now I'm gonna take the same thing this way. And there's the bottom and it's come around to the top, I mean, to the back side and then to the top. So now I've kind of have a circle this way and a circle this way, but I know it's kind of working with this direction. I'm gonna say this is the front, but this is like a three quarter view. So if you wanna see even more of the side, then you just keep turning that box around. But again, this is just maybe a way to kind of help you get an idea. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do is put all those together. So now I've got, this is what the sphere is like inside that box. All right, now kind of coming outside of the box, I'll put the front, I always kind of think of a pig's nose being kind of a cylinder and I'll kind of draw it forward into that. All right, now I'll put an eye here. And then as I come around, the other eye will be here. And then we can kind of do our smile again. And then if I put an ear here, then I will come and come around and go straight through. That's a point there. So you just see kind of the tip of the ear there. Okay, so let's take one of our, our the brush pen. And so there's one eye there. That's one eye there. Okay, so we'll give him a little extra at the bottom there because he's well fit pig. Okay. Okay, so there's our pig head. 
Now, if I want to kind of start working with it a little bit in terms of the shading, I kind of usually think the light's coming down here, this would be more in highlight, but then as it comes down, this could be a little bit darker. So to do kind of cross hatching. Now, instead of, if you have like a, a, a circular shape here, like a cylinder, when you cross hatch, you don't want to go up and down with straight lines. What you want to do is follow the surface. So if the surface is rounded, then when you do your cross hatching, you kind of want to do the same thing. You want to follow the surface. You want to follow the curve of the surface. So when I'm working with this snout there, I want those to be a little bit more rounded, maybe just a little bit of shade over here. Uh, maybe just a little bit of shade in through here. And get his ears. And again, the back of the head would be the same type of thing where you kind of curve around. That's kind of flat, so you don't have to worry about that so much. Okay. So when that dries, we'll give it just a couple minutes to dry. You can then erase it. And so all those guidelines are gone. I've gotten to the point though that, you know, when I'm kind of accustomed to drawing any number of the characters that I do, I just do that intuitively. Um, I showed that to you as maybe a way that you could kind of be thinking. You can also like all this kind of how, how to draw animals, cartoon type thing, books that you can get. Um, they generally kind of break it down and say, okay, we got a box for the head and for the body and stuff. Then you draw a circle and you put two circles together. I mean, th that's totally fine to do that to begin with. But I think at some point, what I have ended up doing is just kind of getting used to um, doing it a little more fluidly. And again, I like the immediacy. You know, so here's this guy, and then I can come back and do another one if I don't like that. So I just do, as, as you could tell by the sketch, uh, sheets of sketching, I do a lot of them. And then what is great is that, especially at the computer age, let's say that, um, I'll find one, of the, okay, let's look through some of these sketches. Uh, there we go. Let's look at some of these that I've got. Let's say that I really like this one and I want to do more with it. <clears throat> tracing paper, take tracing paper and a pencil and I can get the key lines. So there may be a few things I, I will change once I get this done, but I'm not going to trace the whole thing out because it will keep on moving, but give you an idea of what we're talking about here. So if I really like this and I wanna pull it out and I wanna develop it as a separate drawing until itself, I can trace it on tracing paper. I don't know, let's see if I can get it. Yeah, so you can see where it is on the tracing paper. If you take another trace piece of tracing paper and you can see how shiny that is, that's because I used a nine B graphite crayon or 8B pencil, and I built it up with a lot of graphite. And then on a clean piece, I can position the original drawing, trace drawing, put the carbon, put the graphite down first, and then if you use moderate pressure, then I can transfer that onto another sheet. Now, you, I don't even know if people can get carbon paper anymore, but you know, in the old days, <laughs> carbon paper was a way that you could transfer things. It was used mainly for making copies of letters. So if you typed a letter and a piece of carbon paper in between uh, another piece of paper, then you'd get a carbon copy. I don't even know if they make it anymore. But the problem with that, it was really greasy. You can't erase it. So now I've transferred that drawing and this is graphite. So that means that if I want to, if I look at it and I want to change something, I can take an eraser and I can erase it. But usually what I do, um, let's finish off a little bit of that there like that. And I could finish the rest of the drawing. 
But so now I have that character uh, on a clean piece of paper. And if I want to, I can develop a whole story just on it now. Now, if I want to make it bigger, as an example of my t-shirt going from that small pig to a bigger, you can, once you have this inked up, you can scan it, you can take a photograph, put it in your computer, you can blow it up, and then it automatically makes it bigger. And then you could do the same process, uh, or you could use a laser print to kind of get a nice uh, black line down that is indelible to water soluble stuff. So once I get the key drawing transferred, then I can use my pens. And what I like doing is going from thin to thick and then thin again. It gives your lines a little more dynamic quality to it, again, from thin to thick. So when you go around these curves, it, it, it gives you a sense that it's more rounded. And so that'll uh, give a little more weight to your characters. Okay, so we'll... I thought since we're using Faber-Castell materials from Germany, we'd put our pig in a later hoden. I think he's yodeling. It's the other thing I do a lot too is that um, I'll start making little stories in my head about what's going on with these characters if I don't already have something in mind. Okay, and then shadows are always kind of fun to put in there. It gives it a little bit of weight as well. So we could develop a whole story kind of based on this particular character. Um, I also like putting a lot of my, okay, let's give him the shorts. And the rest of it can be him. I like putting hats on everybody too. I said a, a friend of mine who's a fairly well-known illustrator gave a talk and he said that anytime that you have a monkey, you draw a monkey riding on a tricycle you have to make sure that he's smoking a cigar and wearing a fez. Okay, so sometimes they got little extra things going on the side. But the more that I, I kind of start drawing, the more I get into these characters, I, I just have totally lost in my own in my own world. And again, you know, I'm not really sure. Uh, what the story is here, we'll develop it as we go along. But you can see that, you know, with a little bit of extra cross hatching. Yeah, let's give him a little kind of hat. Sometimes it's easier to draw the hat while you're drawing the character, but you, know, you can usually find some way to fit a hat on just about anything. All right. And then you can also change expressions as you go along there. So if I kind of come in here like that, then that makes him look a little, a little happier, a little less anxious. Okay. Now what we can do here, let's get our soft brush out. I get all these things flipped around here. <clears throat> it's a little cannibalistic, but he is seeing like a gigantic Browlhorst has suddenly appeared. Okay, so let's and put a little shade in here to give it a little bit more. Again, like here we have a, a 
bratwurst here is kind of a nice organic shape. So I want to make sure that if I'm going to put a little extra shading in there with cross hatching. Okay, make that a little shadowy there. Give that a little more. Okay, so maybe they're just doing a little dance. Maybe he's intending to consume the bratwurst. They're just dancing together. Okay, so other things. Um, let's uh, get the brush out again. If you think about um, animals, you think about even people. If I'm not sure what kind of person I want to draw, I just start to make these sh these shapes. And you know, you can you can do noses all different ways. You can have noses like that. You can have more like Pinocchio noses. Um, actually, if we do Pinocchio, he's told a lie. He's kind of like the wooden boy. So a lot of times you see these kind of uh, wooden ears that are a little more geometric. Classic Pinocchio hat. They can mess around with the eyes, expressions with the eyes. If he's looking off to the side, maybe that kind of makes him look a little shifty. Eyebrows down. Like, I usually have like these little kind of things. He's got like a pom pom on the top. Little skinny neck, collar. He's not the uh, friendly little Pinocchio guy from the Walt Disney movie. So you decide, you know, you can change expressions. Uh, if you're doing it in ink, you have to be a little more clever about it, you know, how you might be able to change things around. But don't worry about these things being in ink. If you don't like what you're doing, you can always start another one. That's what is so much fun about the sketchbook is just kind of liberates you into trying all sorts of stuff as it's in the sketchbook. All right, so let's, um, let's do a fish. So think about the parts. You can also draw things so that they're flat. I mean, I have a tendency to try to get a, a little bit of volume into the characters that I do. But you can also do very flat things. So like, <clears throat> excuse me, I want to do the classic uh, fish skeleton that cats get out of the uh, garbage cans and old cartoons. So instead of trying to make them look uh, rounded and volumetric, it's perfectly fine to keep things nice and flat. I've got lots of friends that do that. So it's a matter of kind of developing things according to how you want them to look or what feels natural to you. So even if you feel a little awkward, perhaps starting off, go with it, you know, kind of take advantage of, the, you know, things look a little wonky, well then really play that up. 
and you can either change them so that they look a little bit more than you want to, or you might decide that, hey, you know, actually, I kind of like that a little bit better than if I was more successful with my original intent. Okay, so that is much flatter than this other fish. Okay, let me get uh, the brush pen. And I go back and forth between using the, the the fine points, the brush points. Okay, let's come up in through here. So the tends to always put lips on my fish. Okay, and I'll put it eye here. Now you can make it really long, you can make it more like an angel fish, fins on the back. I usually have like a little flipper there, another one here. You know, short tail, big tail. I'm gonna just go right to that guy's face. And some bubbles here. I have like a little. This one I could switch to a. So as I'm I'm drawing my stuff. I'm hoping that you're trying similar things for yourself. Okay, so, you know, if I have a fish, I've got some kind of a wormy looking thing. I'll give him little bubbles too. The classic way in a cartoon to make it look like people are in fish and things are in the water, just have bubbles coming up. The magic of being able to create your own world. Okay, so maybe we put little spots on this one. Okay, so at this point, I might start thinking, oh, this has a little bit of potential here. Let's uh, start developing a scene. So I think about maybe him being on kind of like a little sandbar here and then doing some. Franz, if I can, what sketchbook are you using? Oh, the sketchbook, um, that's really a good question because a lot of times people kind of um, ignore paper as being an important thing, but it's the foundation. This is a, a Legion Stonehenge white. It's a heavier paper, and what I like about this, um, you know, real soon here, uh, better hurry up. I want to get back into coloring, but this is a paper. It's a hundred percent fiber, uh, uh, cotton fiber. It has sizing in it, and sizing in the paper enables you to, with watercolor, um, these are some nice watercolors that we have here from Faber Castell as well. So if I want to um, start coloring these guys. Let's give him some kind of green later hosen, off green. The sizing allows you to put your watercolor down and I'm putting on nice and wet so I can move it around. The sizing uh, protects the paper from immediately absorbing that. So if I would take you know, my chamois cloth or a piece of uh, tissue or something like that, I can kind of blot some of that off if I want to make it lighter. And it'll also enable me to work it around and pool it. I could put a little bit of water down first. And then what's nice, what I like about watercolor, it, it's the pigment is fluent, so you can kind of move it around. So I can kind of use the heel of the brush to kind of get it down where I want it. 
and daub it. And so what the sizing does is it, it keeps the, the fibers of the paper from immediately wicking the, the uh, color so you can't work with it. It's just automatically um, saturated with the pigment. With the sizing, it gives you a chance to pick things up, to move it around. It gives you more time to kind of get what you want. But uh, yeah, this particular sketchbook is my favorite. I, I like the size of it. Um, the paper is heavy enough that you can use watercolor with it. Um, all right, so now what I'm doing here, if you use a, a sketchbook that is uh, lightweight and you do a lot of erasing, or if you're doing watercolor, there's a good chance that it's going to be very frustrating to, to work with it. Um, but you want a nice heavier paper and you want uh, some sizing in it. And it's best if you can get one that has uh, rag, you know, cotton fibers in it. Now, the other thing that I use a lot uh, as well are <laughs> uh, pit pens. All right, so this is kind of my array of pit pens. And these are the same basic formulation as the indie ink that is in the fixed pens except that it's color pigment instead of black. And so that, um, I don't know if the black has dried long enough, but yeah, yeah, that's pretty good. Again, since these are water soluble, they're permanent when they dry. And sometimes it takes a little bit of time for them to, especially the heavier deposits. But these uh, pit pens are especially nice. And as you work with them, if I put one layer down, okay, let it dry just for a little bit. Now, if I put another on top of it, I immediately get a darker value because these are transparent. And so that the more layers you put, the darker it gets. So with one pen, you can get a, a nice range of value. And then on top of that, before they totally dry, and it's because of the sizing of the paper, if you want to, you can hit those with a brush with some water and you can also turn those into a, a watercolor type thing. If I want to pick it up and I can actually even use it to go over on top of it. Now with the Faber-Castell, I also have these, um, yeah, let's see if I can find some here, this color. These are Albrecht Durer uh, watercolor pencils and they are, really great as a color pencil in of themselves. So, you know, if I want, you know, really vibrant, very bright. So we'll give all of his fins and the lips this kind of darker red. So as a color pencil, these are really vibrant. Uh, they're very nice, but the extra, especially nice uh, quality of these as soon as I hit them with a, a brush, they turn in this really intense, vivid watercolor. So uh, these really work nicely as watercolor. And they do exactly what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to, you know, the minute you touch them with water, they become watercolor. So if I want to, too, I can pick some of the excess pigment I have here, and there's enough. Uh, pigment here that if I want to, I can actually use it as if it were off the pans. So another nice uh, set of drawing materials to have handy. Because you can use them both as a pencil and as watercolor. In fact, if you want, you know, if I want uh, another part of the sketchbook here, I can actually use that as like a little mini pan of watercolor. So we'll continue there. And that guy's face that was there is suddenly becoming less and less noticeable because I'm developing the fish itself. Okay, let's, uh, and you can use a, a combination. Uh, what's nice about all the favorite Castell colors is that they're color indexed. And what that means is that if you use an Albrecht or watercolor that this is number 165 and I would go to a pit pen 
and pick 165 or you know any of the materials that are the same number have the same pigment so you can do really nice kind of multimedia type things okay so i got a little green there so i can kind of move it around with my brush and i like to pick up the green and maybe put it on the red a little bit so you get those kind of odd complementary color type things and spread them out once that's dry i could go back again with uh you know some more watercolor more pencil i could come back with some of the pit pens so we kind of have those already done a little bit uh let's work with those just for a second with can i get a little extra pink color on him so the drawing is a lot of fun kind of coloring things in can be quite a bit of fun too didn't quite clean that brush, but we got the little bonus color there. Move that around. Okay. So I think you can get the general idea that you have all these different materials. You come up with your drawings. Um, now I did have one drawing that I did ahead of time that I was using with the. Let's see if I can find it real quick. This one is a good example of what I did earlier with a uh, soft brush. And I put in, you know, some very nice uh, flowing dynamic lines and they just went over it with the pit pens and then went over it with the watercolor pencils. And it's like a whole, you know, kind of little scene that I developed. I just started off with kind of this elephant and I had him on a chair that I thought, well, let's put him in the old fez and smoking satin jacket and, uh, have them read a book and have a picture in the background. It just kept on developing and developing until it was finished. Um, oh, getting there closer and closer to, I had it marked originally and then everything got kind of chaotic. Just give me a couple, oh, here we go. <clears throat> this is one that I, I just started to draw. I was using some new uh, chisel points. These are all the pit pens. And I thought it would show up pretty well on the camera as we kind of add some more color to it. And I did it long enough ago that most of it should be set, set up. Um, so let's start with some pit colors. His feet. And if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer. But again, what I really encourage uh, you to do is to just play in your sketchbook. That's what sketchbooks are for. It gives you a, a chance to experiment. There's no pressure on doing anything uh, the correct way. I come back with the orange. Okay, if I want to, um, let's give him kind of a lighter blue coat. So now I'm going to take the slight uh, darker blue one. I'm going to start giving him some stripes, pinstripe suit. All right, so stripes run down like that, and then around when they they turn, then your stripes should turn. You want to follow the form. All right, so as we come to his legs here, pants legs, then they're going to kind of come across like that. They're going to start arcing down. And just with a uh, little extra detail, it's kind of amazing how uh, 
how fresher the drawings become. Okay, so I'm going to make this just very dark because that's underneath. All right, so I want to kind of put now with these, they're kind of coming down his back and they'll disappear and then they'll kind of come together. Down. Okay, then we can take a even darker blue. Uh, kind of more turquoise blue, I guess. And so now I'm going to kind of come back in and I'm going to start going where I want it to be more kind of like in shadow. So it's not doing too much to the stripes themselves, but it is taking that kind of lighter color in between the darker stripes and making it a little darker. So it's going to start creating more of a sense that this is in highlight, this is in a shadow. Okay, so we'll let that dry for a minute. And then let's start looking at something like that. The snail there. Um, I guess this would be a it's, uh, turn it off here my greens. Let's get my green shell. some watercolor maybe and yeah, let's take this kind of reddish brown color yeah. and then I can go over the uh, pit pen with some watercolor, or I could use another pit pen. Again, it's uh, up to you to just kind of play around, see what you can do. Kind of keep that a little bit wet and make it all kind of spread out a little bit. I know. Okay, so there's a really nice kind of very fluorescent green in this uh, these pans of watercolor. So we'll do the slime trail. Okay, does anybody have any questions? It's always so quiet on my end. It's very easy for me to get lost in kind of what I'm doing here and then just and that happens uh, when I really am having a nice uh, drawing session with my sketchbook. I'm pretty oblivious to time. You know, I'll kind of think, oh, I guess maybe I'll take a break. And I find out they've been doing this for several hours. I just get really, really absorbed. Which is also, uh, you know, part of the value of doing this kind of thing because, you know, it's nice to be able to escape into that part of your your main that's in your, your mind that is intuitive so you can kind of be balancing intuitive with uh intelligence intellect and find that balance where you know you're kind of figuring some things out and then letting your your subconscious kind of direct other things so it's so from actually yes. using the Faber-Castell 
watercolor pans, correct? Yes, yes, yeah. So all okay. these are, yeah. So here's the, this is what they look like. You've got lots and lots of colors. They have some really nice metallics down here. And then these are the fluorescents if you really wanna, you know, we could take, uh, let's take a little bit of this bright pink. So, so you could actually, if you're using the Pit Artist Pen and the Faber-Castell watercolor pans, could you use the white pit pen over these drawings once they're dry? Yeah, you can do that. In fact, that's uh, in that elephant drawing that I was showing you that I hope I can find again someplace. Um, well, let's see, that's gonna be nice and dry there. And what I have to do is find out where I put my white ones. Uh, it's a problem I start uh, piling things up. I know that I had a whole, I've got a smaller one here. I like that they have one that is twice this size that I like because it's really juicy. But what I'm gonna do is go over that blue if I were to bring a highlight back. And so I'm gonna let that dry just a little bit more. And the more that you build it up and the more you build it up, the lighter you can get it. So really you just have to wait until the, the watercolor or the pit pen is dry, correct? Exactly, exactly. Got because it. if you don't, I mean, you can get an effect with it. Like, you know, if I, I put this on something, um, that's still wet, it's gonna lighten it up. But what I'd like about these is that you can start building up highlights again. So if you've maybe made something a little bit too dark, cause so these- dry, You get more opacity with the white. Exactly, it's kind of like a, a whiteout for artists. Okay, I get it. Yeah, and so, uh, yeah, let's up, up here on his beak. You can see I can lighten it up and I'll let it dry and then build it up again. So yeah, you can go over the whole thing one time and then go back and then go back. I've done several drawings on black paper with these things. So that, like, let's go over on top of, of this. So the first one, you can see as it's absorbed and it dries, it's more like a gray. Um, okay, let that dry a little bit more. So you can develop a whole gray scale just by overlapping and overlapping. So the more layers you have, the more opaque it gets. So it starts blocking the blackout. So that's gonna start looking more like a gray than uh, you know, the black and then let that dry. And that's one of the reasons I like the, the, the big ones because they are so juicy that you can get uh, you know, quite an effect very quickly. It takes a little bit longer with these, but, but you, know, you can get more detail with that. Yeah, that's so, a really good technique to know. Yeah, the other thing that's nice about it too is that once the white dries, or the white dries, it's almost like priming your canvas. <laughs> so, you know, if I would take, um, we really have to let this dry to do this, but if I take this green and put it on top of the black, you really can't see it. But if I put it on top of where I had the white, then I can go on top of the black with a color. And that's the other thing I like using these for quite a bit. Um, let me kind of build this one up just a little bit while I dry. I mean, for me, the sketchbook and all these materials, the watercolor pencils, the pit pens, the watercolors, the white pens, uh, and there, there are other materials. Uh, there's an Albrechter watercolor marker <clears throat> all those products, uh, especially because they're color index, they have the same pigment in it. You can mix and match and it, it, it's just really a lot of fun. And I think it's very effective in, in what you can accomplish too. So, all right, let me just, all right. Okay, so we'll do one more color here. Let's do this kind of orangey color. Yeah, so you could cut it. Again, if I just go over the black, it, it, it doesn't come off as being orange, but if I go over where I have the white, and especially if I have enough time, I can put about four or five real solidly uh, dried up layers of, of, of the white. Because the white is opaque. Like I said, it is very similar to kind of the idea of whiteout for, for artists. Well, I think that we're getting close to the end of it. So, uh, I'm going to 
end up doing, I, I really like this drawing. I like the way it turned out about him being plagued by caterpillars and flies and snakes making fun of him and it's going about as fast as a, snow, uh, a snail there. <laughs> so a hard day at the office, although most people are working from home. So maybe a hard day uh, going from one room to the other at house. So if there are no other questions or anything, thank you so much for coming. I hope that uh, I've been able to help you out and uh, encourage you to work in your sketchbooks. Don't worry if your work doesn't look like anybody else's. That's what makes it special. Uh, the whole idea, I think, is trying to develop your own uh, approach. But I hope by you know demonstrating how I do it, you get an idea for some really uh, wonderful materials that you can try using. And you know, the better the material, the better the quality of the paper and the material, uh, the more success you'll have and the whole experience will be much more uh, enjoyable. Instead of finding the materials, the materials will encourage you to try all sorts of things that you may never have thought of before, but it's just like, hey, that's a really cool effect. I just, let's try this, let's try that. So I hope that you all will take your sketchbooks and your materials and uh, you know, just disappear into your own creative world and let all those things that are in your head start coming out on paper and uh, enjoy yourselves and stay healthy. So thanks thank again you. for everybody coming. Thank you, Franz. And thank you everyone for joining us. And we will be doing more of these classes with Michael. So please stay tuned for additional classes with Franz and Faber-Castell. Thanks, everyone. Have a great night. Good night. Bye-bye.